I need to tell you some personal things. First of all, I want to say how much I thoroughly, greatly, wonderfully appreciate all of the, the kind words that I receive on my lessons and my teaching and the things that I am doing, the work that I'm putting forth in a lot of these things. I also greatly appreciate the, uh, not necessarily criticism, but, but advice that I get whenever, you know, some think, hey, maybe you ought to do it this way or whatever. I, I really do appreciate that. And you know what? It, whenever criticism comes, I appreciate that too. I, as I said this morning, I am greatly aware that I am failing in some areas, that I, I'm falling short. And James 1.27 comes to mind most often, and, it, and it, it comes to mind regularly whenever I think about the things that I need to be doing, the, uh, the visiting that I need to be doing that I'm not getting done. I understand. I understand that, that I'm not there for many like I should have been. I want you to know, and this is not a substitute for it, I want you to know that you are all constantly on my mind and constantly in my prayers, but I understand also that's not a, a substitute for, for coming around and being a part of your lives. I, I'm just a man who needs to keep doing better, and that's what we talked about this morning. I say all that to say this. This lesson's not about me. I know that sounded like, you know, here we go, we're going to talk about all this stuff. No. This lesson's not about me. In uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is recorded an incident with Jesus, and Peter, James, and John, where they go up on a mountain, and Jesus is transfigured. We're going to read that uh, in, the, in the account of Mark, Mark chapter 9, if you'll be turning over there. What we, as we read through that, it, it might be difficult in a way to see, okay, why, what are we supposed to learn from this? You know, what are we supposed to get out of these, these things that are recorded for us? Why did Jesus take Peter, James, and John up there? You know, why did this event happen in the first place? Things like that. However, I think there are some lessons that we can learn, and what we're going to look at tonight is we are going to learn from those prominent names that we have in this episode and, and things surrounding uh, some of those people. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly when they had looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. So this, see, I don't have a PowerPoint. I didn't know if you noticed that or not. I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. Because we're going to stay pretty much right here. Uh, I'm going to mention some other passages but I'm not going to go read them. If you want to write them down as we're going through this lesson so that you can go back and look at those later, that would be a good idea to do, I think. But the first thing that I, first person I want us to learn from, first of all, is, is Moses. We want to learn from Moses. Moses, when we think about this episode here that's happening with Christ, Moses appeared with Christ for good reason. He appeared with Christ with, with good reason. He was the great lawgiver and deliverer of God's people, the Israelites, bringing them up out of Egypt. It is said in Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3 that he was more humble 
than any other man of his day. Very humble man. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, it, 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 he talks about how God is going to send a prophet that is like himself. And so, you know, it kind of elevates him a little bit that, you know, hey, God's going to send somebody just like him. And so when we think about Moses appearing there on the mountain with Jesus in his transfiguration, it makes sense that he would be there. But Moses also had his issues. He killed a man in Egypt. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 12. He didn't want to go whenever God called him on that mountain. Exodus chapter 4, 13. And I, I, that, that to me is one of those verses that for a long time fit me so well. God, can you just send somebody else? <laughs> he didn't give God the glory when he brought that water out of the rock. And because of that, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. So Moses had his failings. And we can learn from some of those things, but this lesson's not about Moses. We can learn from Elijah. Elijah is mentioned as appearing with Jesus there at that transfiguration, is he not? And, and as with Moses, Elijah appearing with Christ, that, there's good reason for that. When you think about Elijah and, and how bold of a prophet he was standing there on Mount Carmel against those false gods, against the king, Elijah was so good in his life that God took him up in a whirlwind. He didn't face death. He didn't die. In Malachi chapter, I'm sorry, I didn't give you references, did I? 1 Kings 18, 2 Kings 2, 11. There, I gave you those references. Malachi 4 and verse 5, Malachi prophesied that God would send Elijah before the great and awful day of the Lord. Great things, talking about Elijah. And yet Elijah had his issues. Though he did great things, it seems there is so little written about him. We only read about uh, the things that he did beginning in 1 Kings 17 and going through 2 Kings chapter 2. And there's very little in there. A lot of that is taken up with that incident at Mount Carmel having to do with the, the drought and all of those things. Though he was bold before King Ahab, he cowered in fear at his wife Jezebel, and he ran. I don't know whether you make that as, as he's a coward or whether he's you know, just smart, but, <laughs> but he had his failings. Shortly after that, he fell into such a great depression that God had to send an angel to get him out of it. That's in 1 Kings 19. But this is not a lesson about Elijah. As we look through that, we, we see, of course, Peter. You know, James and John are there, but you know how Peter is. But you think about Peter. Why would Christ bring Peter up on that mountain? Why would Christ bring this mountain? He's just a fisherman. Why would he bring him up there? But as we look forward in his life, we, we see a lot of good things about Peter. I mean, he preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2. He would convert the first Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. He would be a great apostle of the Lord. Matter of fact, Paul actually said this, said he was an effective apostle to the Lord in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 8. He was a great teacher for God. But Peter had his issues. He would deny Jesus three times. And you can find that record in all four gospel accounts. Isn't that interesting how God wouldn't leave that out in any part? He denied the Lord three times. 
He would be called out by Paul in that same chapter where he said he was an effective apostle. Paul would then turn around and call him out because he would eat with the Gentiles as long as there were no other Jews around. But as soon as Jews came from Judea, well, he, he withdrew from them. And Paul said that ought not to be. And then we have here. <laughs> did you see what he did? Looking in verse 5 again, the rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say. I don't know if I've learned that lesson yet or not. But there have been times that I have said something and I realized, you know what, I didn't have any business saying anything. But because I didn't know what to say, I said something. Peter's got his faults. But this lesson's not about Peter. When we look at these three men that seem to be brought out of this message, this lesson, what we find at the end of this is it is not about these men, just like it's not about me as a preacher. In verse 7, that cloud came over and came and overshadowed them, and the voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. One of the uh, best advice that I have been given as a preacher and I've heard it many a times don't stand in the way of Jesus I was reminded of this uh, not, not from something that I did but uh, someone else was asking me some advice and you know about their preaching and, and some different things and Sometimes we can get caught up in ourselves. Sometimes we can get caught up in, you know, what we know or what we think we know. And we allow that to be at the forefront when it's Jesus. Moses is not the prophet who brought the law. Jesus is. Elijah is not the prophet who has been sent to stand up to Satan. Jesus is. It is not their words which must be heard, but it's Jesus' words that must be heard. When all else are gone, Jesus will be there. So this lesson tonight is not about me. It's not about Moses. It's not about Elijah. It's not about Peter. Great man. Great men sent by God. But even in that moment, when Jesus is standing in all of his glory and these two men were chosen to stand with him, Luke tells us that they were talking about Jesus' upcoming death. Important men in the life and the mission of Jesus. But it was not about them. Peter oftentimes is, you know, he's, he's kind of looked down upon because of his mouth. <laughs> but there were times where
where he came shining through. Think about in Matthew chapter 16. Whenever Jesus asked his disciples, you know, who, who do men say that I am? And, and they responded, you know, some, some think that you're John, some think that you're Elijah or one of the prophets. Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And it was Peter. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not about Peter. He was, he was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. But it's not about Peter. It's about Jesus. There are many who may be in your lives that over the years you have looked up to and you have admired. I know there are many in my life that I have looked up to and admired for the way that they preach, for the way that they live their lives, for the, the kindness that they show people, for the things that they do that I don't think to do a lot of times. But just like then, there were prophets, there were apostles, there were preachers, elders, faithful members. But there's only one. There is only one who is our perfect example. There is only one by whom his name we will be saved. I believe that's in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, if you're still writing down references. There's only one way to get to the Father. And I absolutely guarantee you it is not through me. It is not through me. Nor is it through any other preacher that may stand up here and preach to you. It is only through Jesus Christ. John chapter 4 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This evening, if you are here and you are not a member of the Lord's church and you want to be, you've got to do it Jesus' way. You've got to do it by his rules, by his word. In John chapter 8 and verse 24, I believe it is, he said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus said in Luke chapter uh, 13, verse 3, verse 5, he said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. We've got to repent. We've got to change our minds. He said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, that if, we'll deny, if, we, if we confess his name before others, he'll confess our name before God. But if he denies, if we deny his name, then he'll deny us before the Father. We've got to confess his name with our mouths, Romans chapter 10. And then we must submit to him in obedience. Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Not he who believes and says a prayer. Not he who believes and says, oh, I feel good, the Spirit must be on me, and so I must be saved. No. It's he who believes and obeys the baptism that he has prescribed for us. Then, and only then, will we be saved, because that's his verse that I mentioned this morning, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 22, I believe it was. He says, those who are endure to the end will be saved. We must remain faithful in our lives. Not faithful to any man, no matter how good you might think he is, but faithful to the only one who can give us eternal life. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord.
this evening, if you're ready to obey that gospel, we're ready to assist you. If you need to study more about it, we're, we're willing to study. We're ready to go. If there is something in your life as a Christian that needs to be corrected, if we can help you do that, please come and see us. If you need to meet with the elders for some reason, look, you need to ask. We don't always know, you know, what we need to be working on. So if you have a need, please ask. Whatever it might be, if it's for here tonight, right now at this moment, won't you come forward while we stand and while we sing?